Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. One of the problems in dissecting the submandibular carotid triangle area at this point in your dissection is going to be to try to reorient yourself. We'll have to remember back to some of the earlier stages in this dissection. The skin covered this entire area of the neck, and when that was removed, the muscle that was exposed is a subcutaneous muscle, the platysma muscle. That muscle was reflected to the base of the mandible, and then covering this entire area was the remaining deep cervical fascia, which continued up and on to the face. Now, now that we've exposed then this area, we should go over some of the landmarks in order to define our triangles. The first major landmark of the lateral neck is the sternocleidomastoid and its anterior border as seen here. Next, the hyoid bone is located at this point and attaching to the hyoid bone then, the anterior belly of the digastric and posterior belly of the digastric. We can see that the superficial lobe of the submandibular gland is covering that posterior belly, but here it passes up in this direction. From the hyoid passing downward is the omohyoid muscle, and this then defines the series of triangles that we want to study, namely the carotid triangle, which extends then along this direction on the omohyoid, the anterior belly of sternocleidomastoid, and the posterior belly of the digastric. You should keep in mind that this triangle, in fact, is opened artificially up here at this end, because in your last dissection, you remember that we found the angular tract, which extended from the angle of the mandible over to the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid. In order to demonstrate the vascular and neural components of this triangle, we've had to open up that fascial area. The submandibular triangle then extends between the anterior and posterior bellies of digastric and the inferior margin then of the mandible. Anteriorly, there's a center triangle that extends above the level of the hyoid up to the mental region and is bounded on each side by the anterior border then of the anterior belly of digastric. Its floor is made up of a single muscle the mylohyoid. Now that we're oriented in this region, let's consider some of the vascular supply of the carotid triangle. First, superficially, we see that you have the vessels which we've already seen passing from the retromandibular area, but we also have this facial vessel which will pass in and usually is connected in some manner to the deep venous structure. Uh, in order to expose this area, you will need to reflect the venous, superficial venous structure by just snipping through it and removing it from the area. As we do so, however, um, we'll show you one vessel which sometimes you're not able to demonstrate, and that is that at the level of the angle of the mandible, because this fascia is so heavy, in removing it, you frequently will cut a small vessel which will pass to the posterior pharyngeal wall. It is a posterior pharyngeal vein draining this pharyngeal region. We'll continue reflecting venous structures in order to more clearly show the arterial. The large vein, of course, here is the internal jugular, and now that can be laid back also. Once this is done, the major project today then is to clean up the extent and path of the common carotid and its bifurcation, the internal and external carotid, and specifically its branches and trunks which lie within this carotid triangle. There are three that I'd like to point out to you right now. One is a branch here, which is the occipital artery. It has an important relationship with a nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, which passes around the artery to pass into the facial region. The facial artery 
as you can see here, going superficial to the superficial lobe of the submandibular gland, it may in fact pass deeply in, in most specimens. And the lingual artery, which is located here. Once you have cleaned these structures up so that you can see, we'll then proceed into the submandibular triangle to see how these triangle, how, how these uh, vascular components of the triangle extend anteriorly. The submandibular triangle is filled generally by this superficial lobe of the submandibular gland, which I want to reflect now. And once that is reflected and out of the way, we can see a very important feature then of this area. Namely, that there are two muscles and their posterior borders that we must define. Here, you can see the mylohyoid. And if we look posteriorly, we see the posterior margin of the hyoglossus. Now, in this region, we have a large cleft which passes into the paralingual space. There are two things which pass into that cleft and need to be defined. The posterior, or rather the deep lobe of the submandibular gland and the hypoglossal nerve. These both lie then superficial to this large hyoglossus muscle. At the posterior border of hyoglossus muscle, you should be able to locate then the lingual artery passing deep to it. The lingual artery, as it passes superior to the hyoid, swings superiorly to enter the submandibular triangle. And in fact, it is at this point that this artery is approached surgically. If one is to split the fibers of the hyoglossus muscle and reach in, one can demonstrate the blood vessel at this point, the lingual artery. And you notice its sharp turn to pass into the tongue. Another artery, which has an interesting branch that frequently is difficult to demonstrate, and because we have injected this system with red latex, one can see a branch of the facial artery, which again arises near the angle of the mandible. And here's again the angle. And if you can follow the artery back, here's the artery. At this point, the artery will send a small branch which will ascend, it is the ascending palatine artery, a branch then of the facial artery. There are two structures that are vascular then that are in the area of the angle of the mandible, pharyngeal branches draining to the venous system we have seen, and this ascending palatine branch of the facial. These are some features that you want to be careful of when you're removing the fascia from this region. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.